G'day, g'day. Praise God, I hope you're all well. Uh, today, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to read something to you guys. Uh, I found something that's pretty awesome down at the uh, local op shop, the Opportunity Shop. I found a uh, copy of something that's called the Aussie Bible. Uh, it is... It is just uh, like some of it. I think there's a larger book. This one is the gospel so i'm going to read the gospel to you in the australian vernacular this is written by a man called kel richards it's re it's the gospel story retold by kel richards from the bible society of new south wales uh, i generally don't read any bible other than the king james version uh, that's the only one i like it's the only one that any sh anyone should read really it's the one that's ordained by god uh it's the one that the Catholic Church tried to suppress for so long. It's the one that they've tried to drown out in a sea of hundreds of different types of Bibles since then. The Jesuits and the Catholic Church have tried to uh, basically just uh, drown out the King James Bible in a sea of other versions since then. They change verses, they take out critical things, and... Um, yeah, so I don't mess with any Bible, but the King James, usually. But this is something a little different. This is just uh, a bit of fun. This is the gospel story retold in the Australian vernacular, like it was told by somebody who was in the country, country um, Australia, maybe out back in the 1960s. It's got that old vernacular, that Aussie jargon. So I'm going to read to you. The story of Jesus Christ in some dinky die Aussie vernacular. So, all right, let's get going. We'll start off with surprising news. In the days when old Herod was boss cocky of Judea, and there was a sky pilot named Zechariah, known to his mates as Zech, who was married to a Sheila named Libby. They were both good. Decent sort of people who'd lend you a cup of sugar or a fiver till payday. But they had no ankle biters because poor Lib had this medical problem on top of which they were both getting a bit wrinkly. Anyway, one time when Zek was on duty at the temple in Jerusalem, they drew straws to see who'd go to the inner room to light the candles and Zek got the short straw. When it was lighting up time, everybody was hanging around outside, praying and so on, and Zek barged in and got the fright of his life. Right in front of him was an angel, as large as life and twice as ugly. Zek turned as white as a sheet, but the angel said, Put yourself together, old son. Your prayers have been heard. You and Libby will have a kid, and you have to name the little sprog John. He'll be a really cute little tyke will brighten up your life, and there'll be more than just you and Lib who'll end up being glad he was born. That's because God's got his eye on your John. He'll be a teetotaler who'll know what God wants and will nag away at the conscience of the nation. Lots of blokes will turn back to God because of him. You've read the yarns about Elijah back in the olden days. Well, it'll be the same stuff over again with your John. Zek shook his head and said, Come off the grass. How can we have a kid? Me and Libby are old codgers. The angel said, Listen, mate, I'm Ga I am Gabriel. You've heard of me, right? Well, I've come from God with this bit of news, good news for you, and all you do is whinge. So, from now on, your mouth is as dumb as your brain, all because you wouldn't believe what you were told. Meanwhile, the crowd outside was wondering what had happened to Zek. It doesn't take all that long to light the candles. So what was he up to? When Zek finally came out, he couldn't speak. What's up, they all said. Cat got your tongue? They worked out something pretty stunning had happened because he kept waving his hands about trying to make them understand. When his time on the roster was up, he went back home. And sure enough, not long afterwards, Libby was preggers. Definitely had a bun in the oven. For the first five months of the pregnancy, she kept to herself pretty much. This is God's doing, she said. 
He's seen to it that I've become a mum. Just like all of my girlfriends. A message for Mary. When Libby was six months gone, God sent the same angel, this Gabriel bloke, to a back blocks town called Nazareth in Galilee Shire to a nice young girl who is engaged to the local carpenter, Joe Davidson. Her name was Mary. The angel said to her, G'day, Mary. You're a pretty special Sheila. God has, has his eye on you. Mary was weak at the knees and wondered what was going on. But the angel said to her, Don't panic. Don't chuck a wobbly. God thinks you're okay. You're about to become pregnant and you'll have a son and you're to call him Jesus. He will be a very big wheel and will be called the Son of God the Most High. God will give him the throne of his father, your ancestor, King David, and he will be in charge of the whole show forever. But how, said Mary, Joe and I have done the right thing. We've never, well, you know, I mean to say, I'm still a virgin. The angel answered, leave the mechanics up to God. This is heavenly stuff. God's spirit will come upon you and the big brain behind the big bang will manipulate the necessary molecules to make it happen. So this little kid of yours will be as special as it's possible to be, and he'll be called God's own son. Look, even Libby, your old cousin, is preggers. At her age, God can do these things. In fact, Libby is in her sixth month because nothing is impossible with God. God's in charge, Mary answered. If that's what God wants, then it's what I want. Then the angel nicked off and left her alone. Mary visits Elizabeth. Mary didn't muck about. She got packed and ankled it up to a town in the hills where she went straight to Zek and Libby's place so that she could say g'day to Lib. When Libby heard Mary's cooey at the front door, the baby in her womb gave a kick like a footy player at a grand final and Lib was filled with God's spirit. With a big grin and a voice that could rattle windows, she said, Good on you, Mary, you beaut. God's chosen you out of all the Sheilas in the world, and your baby will be God's toddler. But stone the crows, why would the mum of my big boss, my lord, come and see me? As soon as I heard the sound of your voice, my little bun in the oven went bananas with excitement. Good on ya for believing what God told you, for believing that God can do what he says he can do. And, and then Mary said, my soul is as happy as Larry with God and my mind is buzz is just buzzing with God, my rescuer, because he picked me, me, and I'm about as important as a bottles washer's assistant. But from now on, everyone who ever lives will call me well off, looked after by God, for the one who can do anything has done great things for me. His name is the only name that matters. His gentleness rolls on like a river. He has done great things that will just knock your socks off. The rich, the stuffed shirts, the boss cockies don't impress God. He knocks them off their perch. But those who don't have the tickets have tickets on themselves, he gives a hand to. He provides tucker for the hungry and sends the toffee noses away without a feed. He has wrapped his great arms around the chosen. He hasn't forgotten his kindness and gentleness. Exactly what he promised yonks ago is what is happening now. Mary stayed with Libby for a few months and then nicked off back home again. John is born. When her nine months were up, Libby popped her sprog. The next door neighbours and the rallies all heard that God had been kind to her and were tickled pink. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise little tyke as the habit was in those days. And they were going to call him Zek after his dad. But his mum spoke up and said, Not on your Nelly. Call him John. They said, But hang on, you haven't got any rels named John. They made signs to Zek, his dad, to find out what handle he wanted to give the kid. He asked for a bit of paper and a pencil, and he knocked down and he knocked him down all and he knocked them all for six when he scribbled down his name is John. 
At once, Zach could talk again. And then he couldn't stop yabbering, saying how terrific God was. The next door neighbors had the wind knocked right out of them by this. And soon, the bush telegraphed was full of it. And in the hill country, it was all they talked about. Zek has a few words to say. John's dad, Zek, was full of God's spirit and said, Good on God, the Lord, the boss, the God of his people, because he's begun his rescue mission to planet Earth. He is flying the flag of old King David, as he promised yonks and yonks ago. His cavalry is riding to our rescue. He'll rescue us from the sharks who run this world, and we'll be his. And we'll be free to follow his orders without a care in the world. And you, my son, will be the mouthpiece of the maker. You'll go first to get things ready, to tell people the rescuer and ruler is on his way, so they can have their slates wiped clean. God's sunshine is about to pop through the clouds and send the shadows scooting away, showing us the track through the bush, the path of peace. And the kitty grew up until he was big as a fullback and as strong as a mallee bull. And he lived out in the bush, all alone like a bandicoot on a burnt ridge, until it was time for him to start spreading the news. Jesus is born. In those days, Caesar Augustus ordered a head count of the whole Roman world. This was the first big tally when Quirinius ran the Syrian branch of the empire. And everybody had to go back to the bit of country where they were born in to fill the forms. So Joe hiked up from Nazareth in Galilee Shire to Bethlehem in Judea Shire because this spot in the Mulga was where King David came from, and Joe's family tree had King David up in the top branches. He went there to fill in the forms and sign the register with his fiancée, Mary, who was pretty near nine months at this time. While they were there, she gave birth to a baby boy. She wrapped him in a bunny rug and tucked him up in a feed through the back shed because the pub was full to bursting. News flash. There were some drovers camped out in a paddock nearby, keeping an eye on their mob of sheep that night. Their eyes shot out on stalks when an angel of the Lord zapped into view and the glory of the Lord filled the air like a thousand volts of electricity. The angel said, Stop looking like a bunch of stunned mullets. Let me give you the drum, the good oil. It's top news for the whole crew, everybody, everywhere. Today in that little town on the hill, a rescuer has been born. He is the promised one, the king, the lord. And here's how you'll find him. The little nibber is wrapped up in a bunny rug and lying in a food trough. And before you could say, well, I'll be blowed. The whole sky was filled with more angels than you could count, all singing away at the top of their lungs, if angels have got lungs, that is. God is great. God is bonza. And to everybody on this planet who's on God's side, peace and goodwill. And by the way, happy Christmas. Which rather confused the drovers because they'd never heard of Christmas before. Suddenly, the whole choir had nipped off in the blink of an eye. The drovers said to each other, we better make tracks to Bethlehem and have a squeeze at what happened. Check out this message from God. So the lot of them shot through like a Turak tram to Bethlehem and they found Mary and Joe and the baby who was, sure enough, wrapped in a bunny rug and lying in a food trough. When they'd seen this, they told every Tom, Dick and Harry about what had happened and everyone who had heard the story was blown away by it. But Mary just made a mental note of these things and tucked them away in the corner of her heart. The drovers went back to the paddock and their mob of sheep, as excited as a racehorse on a Melbourne Cup day, saying what a bottler God was because everything was spot on, just as they'd been told. Simeon 
On the eighth day, at his circumcision, Joe and Mary's little kid was given the name Jesus. The name the angel gave him when he turned up with the big announcement. When all the bits and pieces required by old laws had been done, Joe and Mary took their baby to Jerusalem to say thank you to God and to say he's yours because God's book says if a woman's first baby, baby is a boy, he's to be dedicated to God and to make an offering of a couple of budgies as required by the old law. Now there was an old codger in Jerusalem named Simeon who was a dead set good bloke. He was waiting for the coming of the king God had promised yonks ago. God's spirit had given him the nod that he wouldn't tumble off the twig until he'd seen him. And God's spirit gave him the whisper that he should go into the temple that day. So, when Mary and Joe arrived with their baby, Jesus, Simeon was there and said, Can I have a nurse of the bub? And as he took him in his arms, he said, Dear God, now I can die a happy bloke. I have seen the promised one, just as you said I would. I have seen the one who is your rescue mission to the world. He will be a lighthouse, a spotlight. And by this light, people from all over the shop will see how terrific you are. The baby's mum and dad were staggered by this. Then old Simeon said, God bless you all. And he said to Mary, this boy will be good news to heaps of people and bad news to heaps of others. Many won't like him and will put the boot in and he will show up many of them for what they are and your own heart will be broken one day too. Anna There was also at the temple an old duck named Anna. Her dad had been a bloke named Fanuel, Asher. She'd been married for seven years and then her old man had carked it. And since then, she'd been a widow. She was now 84 years old. She was a real devout old duck, always up at the temple. She too came up to Mary and Joe, just to say thanks to God. And tell everyone who was waiting for the promised one that he had turned up. The wise guys. When Jesus was born in the township of Bethlehem, in Judea Shire, when Herod was the kingpin, some eggheads from out east turned up in Jerusalem asking everyone where's this new prince of the Jews the promised one who's just been born we saw his star out east and we've come to say g'day your majesty now this made Herod as jumpy as a wallaby on hot rocks and stirred up the whole town so Herod got some of his cronies together smart blokes who had more degrees than a thermometer and asked them where the promised one was supposed to be born they said Bethlehem was the spot and quoted the words of the prophet. Bethlehem is a little place, but landing here from outer space will be a leader who will keep a shepherd's eye on all the sheep. So Herod called the eastern eggheads to a secret meeting and asked them when the star had first popped up. Then he told them to nick off to Bethlehem, search around the township and find this kid. When you find him, said Herod, send me the word and I'll pop across and have a squiz at him too. After the king had ear bashed them, they took off for Bethlehem. The star they'd seen out east was there and they were beside themselves. They hurried into the cottage and found the baby with Mary his mum and they bowed and scraped and gave him some terrific prezies, gold and frankincense and myrrh, strange prezies for a baby but better than a hanky or a pair of socks. In a dream, God told them to avoid Herod like the plague, so they set off back home, taking a different road. Escape Then Joe had a dream, in which he saw God's angel saying, Hop up, take the baby and his mum, and... Make tracks for Egypt, quick smart. Stay there till I give you the nod. Because Herod is going bananas over this. Even though it was the middle of the night, Joe bundled them up and set off for Egypt in two ticks. They stayed there until Herod was safely dead, fulfilling the old prediction, I called my son out of Egypt.
Slaughter. When Herod discovered the eastern eggheads had diddled him, he turned, he turned very nasty. He sent his thugs to the Bethlehem district to kill all the little boys under two. Based on what the eggheads had said, this fulfilled Jeremiah's prediction. A weeping voice will wail and mourn for the babies who were born. There is no comfort, they all cried, for all the mums whose babies died. Home again. With Herod himself dead, God's angel once again spoke to Joe in Egypt in a dream and said, It's okay to take the baby and his mum back to Israel because that nasty piece of work is now pushing up daisies. Joe and his little family set off for Israel, but when he heard that Herod's son, Archelaus, had seized power in Judea, he knew that only a deal would go there. And after getting another dream, message from God, headed off for Galilee and set up home in the township of Nazareth. This was another prediction fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Snapshot of Jesus, age 12. Every year, Joe and Mary went up to Jerusalem for a big do called Passover Day. When Jesus was 12, he went with them, like most 12-year-olds. After the festival festivities were over, while his mum and dad were on their way back home, young Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but because the road was chockers, he wasn't missed. Thinking he was somewhere with the Nazareth mob, they hiked on all day. Then, blow me down, when they looked, he wasn't there. When none of their friends and none of their rels had seen him, they headed back to the big smoke. For three days, they had fanatically hunted in every nook and cranny, and finally found him in the temple with the teachers, the bigwigs, listening and asking questions. When his mum and dad saw where he was, they were knocked sideways. His mum said, We've been worried silly about you. Your dad and I have searched all over the place for you. Why search? Jesus replied. Hadn't you tumbled to the fact that I'd be here in the temple, my father's house? But his mum and dad just scratched their heads. They hadn't a clue what he meant. Then it was back to Nazareth, where Jesus was a good son to them. Mary tucked these little memories away in the corner of her heart. Jesus grew up to be sensible and smart, tall and strong, and everybody liked him. The blokes around him, and God too. John the Baptist. This brings us some 15 years. This brings us to some 15 years after Tiberius Caesar took over, running the whole Roman mob. A bloke named Pontius Pilate had the franchise for Judea, while Herod ran Galilee Shire. His brother Phil ran the Archeria and Trachonitis branch, and Licinius Lis, Lisanius controlled. Abilene. Two blokes named Annas and Caiaphas ran the temple. God gave the whisper to John, the son of Zech, in his desert hump humpy. So John went all over the Jordan water catchment area, calling to everyone to turn back to God to get their slate wiped clean. This is what old Isaiah said yonks ago, a voice shouting from the bush. Prepare a track for the Lord to travel on. Widen the track, spread out the gravel, cut down the bumps, fill in the dips, straighten the curves, smooth out the ruts, and everyone will see the arrival of God's rescue mission to planet Earth. Here's a sample of John's preaching to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him. You mob of snakes! God's very aggro with you! Who warned you to try to scuttle out of the way? Don't just say, Abraham was our old man. God can make kids for Abraham out of the lumps of rock if he wants to. God's axe is already hanging over your heads, and you'll be cut down unless you turn over a new leaf. This was a tall order, the mob whinged. If God stacks on a turn, what can we do? If you've got a couple of coats, said John, give one to a bloke who's freezing. Share your tucker with folks that need a feed. Even the tax collectors, who were sharks and bush rangers, came along and said, What do you want us to do? John said, 
Give people a square deal. Stop robbing them. Blind. And some soldiers said, What about us? John said, Don't behave like thugs. Don't demand money with menaces. And live on your pay packet. Everybody got real excited and said, Could John be the promised one? But John said, Look, I'm just baptizing with water. But another bloke is coming who runs on six cylinders compared to my one. I'm not good enough to put his thongs on his feet. He'll baptize not with water, but with fire and with God's spirit. He's ready to drive his harvester out over the paddock and grain goes into the silo. But the chaff is chucked out and burned in the fire that never goes out. That's how John told the people the good news. But John also ticked off Herod, boss of Galilee, because of a bird called Herodias, his brother Phil's wife, and a stack of other stuff he'd done wrong. Naturally, Herod stacked on a turn and chucked John in prison, making one more wrong thing that he'd done. Jesus gets baptized. When the crowds were being baptized, Jesus joined the queue. And he too was baptized. Then, as he then as he prayed, the sky opened up and God's spirit came down like a big white cockatoo and settled on him. God said, you are my own dear son and I'm really pleased with you. A battle of the wills. God's spirit led Jesus away from the river beyond the driest part of the bush to the stony desert where old Nick nagged at him for 40 days. I'm just going to clarify here. Old Nick is Satan. During that whole time, Jesus didn't have a bite to eat. And by the end of his stomach, he thought his throat had been cut. Then that old devil said to him, If you're God's son, use your powers to turn this lump of rock into a nice piece of fresh damper. Jesus answered, The Bible says you can't live on just tucker. To survive, to survive, you need every word God has spoken. Then old Nick whipped, whipped him up to the top of the temple tower and said, You can easily impress this little lot. Show them you're God's own son. Jump off. There's a bit in your precious Bible that says, God will send his angels to, you to stop you splattering like a tomato sauce on the footpath. Jesus answered, The Bible also says, don't think up foolish tests for God, your Lord. Finally, old Nick took him up to a hilltop and pointed out all the kingdoms of the world, saying, This whole lot can be yours, Jesus, my lad. You can have the whole lot bowing and scraping to you at a perfectly reasonable price. Just bow down to me, and with a snap of my fingers, they're all yours. Now, I can't say fairer th than that, can I? Jesus answered, The Bible says that the, that only God is God, and the, and the God is the only one that we should serve as God. At this point, old Nick chucked in the towel, at least for the time being. The work begins. Jesus went back to Galilee Shire, and pretty soon, the Bush Telegraph was filled with news about him. He gave talks in the Jewish meeting halls, and everybody said he was a knockout speaker. Hometown Blues He went back to his hometown of Nazareth, and on a Saturday, he went to the Jewish meeting hall and stood up to read the Bible. The bit he read came from Isaiah, and he read these words, God's Spirit is on me. He's picked me to tell the good news to the poor, set the prisoners free, open the eyes of the blind, give a hand to the downtrodden, and tell everyone... This is the time that God has chosen. Then he closed the Bible, gave it back to the usher and sat down. Everyone's eyes were glued on him as he said, This bit of Bible has come true today, right here and now. The whole mob liked him and spoke well of him and said how well he spoke. How come, they all said, this is just the carpenter's kid. Jesus said to them, I reckon I know what you're going to say. You'll quote the old proverb, Doctor. Treat your own illness, meaning, do the stuff. Do the stuff here. In your hometown, you did in Capernaum. But straight up, 
No one who speaks God's words is listened to in his, whole, in, in his hometown. Back in Elijah's day, there was a drought for three and a half years and everyone was scratch, scratching for food. There were heaps of widows, windows, no, sorry. There were heaps of widows in Israel, but God didn't send Elijah to any of them, but to a foreign widow, to Zarephath, in the Zarephath, Zarephath, in the Sidon land. And in, El- and in Elisha's day, there was heaps of lepers in Israel, and the one God healed was a foreigner, Naaman, the Syrian. At this, the whole mob blew a fuse and decided to throw him out of the town. Worse, they dragged him to a cliff where they were about to chuck him down. When they found he'd slipped through their fingers and left them. A tormented man. Jesus went to Capernaum, also in Galilee, Galilee Shire. And on a Saturday, he began to teach the mob there. They were staggered because this was clearly a bloke who knew what he was talking about. In the Jewish meeting hall, there was a bloke with a devil of a spirit in him who yelled out, Oi, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to do us in? I've got your number. You're the promised one of God, aren't you? But Jesus cut off this racket by saying, Silence, leave this bloke and shove off. Then the bloke fell in a heap and the devil of a spirit nicked off, leaving him without a scratch. This took everybody's breath away. What is this? They all said. This bloke says jump, and they say how high. Amazing. And soon the gossip mills were grinding out this latest news about Jesus. A crowded surgery. Jesus left the Jewish meeting hall and popped into Peter's place because Pete's mother-in-law was feeling crook. And Jesus had been asked to see what he could do. So Jesus bent over and ticked off the collie wobbles that had her feeling rotten. And bingo, she was better. She got straight up and put on the kettle to make them all a cuppa. At sundown, they started flocking in. It was like a hospital waiting room. Jesus touched each one, and they were okay. And more of those mad demons came out of people, bellowing, You, you, you are God's own son. Jesus gave them their own marching orders. And then made them stop their babbling because they knew he was the promised one. At the crack of dawn, Jesus went out to be on his own, but the mob went hunting for him because they didn't want him to leave. I have to, said Jesus. My job is telling the good news in other towns too. That's my job. And he kept on speaking in the Jewish meeting halls in Judea Shire. Jesus goes headhunting. One day, Jesus was down by the water's edge at Lake Gennesaret with heaps of people crowding around, listening to his message from God. On the shore were a couple of skiffs belonging to the fishermen. Jesus got into the one belonging to Simon and told him, to row, to row out just a little, and then he talked to the mob on the shore from his seat at the back of the boat. When he'd finished, he turned to Simon and said, Pull out into the deeper water and drop your nets. Fair go, complained Simon. We fished all night and haven't even caught a tiddler. But today, if you reckon, well, we'll do it. But okay, if you reckon, well, we'll do it. This time, when they tried to yank the nets back into the boat, they almost tore. They were so full. Simon yelled out to his mates to come out in their boat and give them a hand. Soon both boats were so full of fish and so low in the water that a good wave might have sunk them. This shook Simon up to no end. He looked at Jesus and said, You ought to clear off. I'm not a good bloke. Simon and all his mates were almost speechless at the size of the catch. And so were his partners in the fishing business, Jim and John Zebedee. Don't panic, said Jesus. Calm down. From now on, you'll be catching blokes, not fish. So they rowed to the shore, left their fishing tackle where it was, and followed Jesus. Leprosy. 
While Jesus was in a little township, a bloke came up with really bad leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he just dropped in the dust and pleaded with him, Sir, if you want to, you can heal these sores and make me well and whole. I certainly want to, Jesus said, reaching out and touching the leper. Then Jesus gave an order to the man's skin, Be clean. In the blink of an eye, no leprosy. Jesus gave the bloke strict orders. Don't go blabbing about this. Just get yourself off to the temple and follow all the rules so that you can be registered as officially clean and healed. But the news got out anyway. And the mob got bigger and bigger. Every man and his dog wanted to get an instant cure. But Jesus took off to a quiet spot so he could pray. Forgiveness power. One day, a bunch of lawyers were hanging around listening to Jesus. They'd come from just about every township in Galilee Shire and Judea Shire and from the big smoke from Jerusalem. God gave Jesus tons of power to heal the sick. But then, blow me down, some blokes were trying to get their paralyzed mate on a stretcher to Jesus but it was like a grand final crowd that day and they couldn't barge through. So they dragged their mate on a stretcher up onto the roof, yanked off a few tiles and then lowered him down smack in the middle of the room. When Jesus saw how much trust in him there was, he said to the paralyzed bloke, Old chap, your sins are forgiven. The lawyer sneered. This boofhead thinks he is God. God can forgive sins only. But Jesus knew what was going on inside their noggins and said to them, So that's what you think, is it? Just watch this. Which of these is easier, to say to this bloke, Your sins are forgiven, or to say to him, You're cured, get up and walk. Now this ought to show you that I have the power to forgive sins. He turned to the paralyzed bloke and said, Hop up, pick up your stretcher and go home. Straight off, the bloke stood up and picked up his stretcher. The crowd parted in front of him like the Red Sea in front of Moses. And he set off for his home, saying how terrific God was. Everyone was staggered and said, Well, starve the lizards. How about that? An unlikely team member. A bit later, Jesus came across a local bloke who collected taxes for the Roman army, a bloke called Matt Levy. Sitting at his desk, Jesus said to him, follow me. The taxman left his account books in the cash drawer and followed Jesus. Then Matt Levy turned on a humdinger of a barbie in his front veranda and all his mates from the tax office were there getting stuck into the snags and tomato sauce along with Jesus and his mates. So the lawyers got all snide again and yelled out, Why are you hanging around with that bunch of sharks? Jesus said, Blokes who are in, who are in the pink don't need a doctor. Only those who are crook. I've come to call the wrong to turn away from their wrongdoing and turn back to God. I haven't come for the blokes who think they're already hunky-dory. Skipping meals. Their next big whinge was that Jesus and his mates were feasting, not fasting, and they said, Zek's son John, who did all that baptizing in the river, he and his mates used to pray instead of eat, while your lot are forever putting on the billy and tipping into the tucker bag. Jesus told them, It's like a wedding. What do you do at a wedding? Do you starve, or do you get stuck into the grub? Time's coming when I'll be taken away from them. Then they won't feel like eating. Then Jesus said, Look, it's like this. No one patches up an old pair of jeans with a bit of new, unshrunk denim. When it starts to shrink, it'll just tear off and make an even worse hole. And no one puts the latest wine harvest into the old barrels that are dried up and cracked. The barrels would burst and you'd, you'd lose the lot. New wine goes in new barrels. Of course, after drinking the vintage stuff, no one wants the new wine. Let it age, they say. The old is the best.
a proper day off. On one particular day off, a Saturday in that part of the world, Jesus and his mates were walking through a wheat paddock. Some of the blokes pulled off a couple of ears of wheat and rubbed them in their hands the way you do to get the husks off and ate the wheat. At this, some of the lawyers did their lolly. Oi, they said, that's illegal. You're not allowed to work on a day off. That's our law and harvesting wheat is work. Jesus replied, haven't you read your Bibles? Haven't you read what King David said when his men were hungry? He went into the temple and nicked the holy bread that was supposed to be for the priests. He not only ate some himself, he gave it to his men too. Then he added, I am master even of days off. In your case, that means Saturdays. A bloke with a crippled hand. On another day off, another Saturday, when Jesus went to the Jewish meeting hall to give a talk, there was a bloke whose hand was all withered up. The lawyers were watching Jesus like a hawk to see if he'd have a go at healing on a day off. But Jesus knew there was ticking over inside their heads, what was ticking over inside their heads. So he told the bloke with the crook hand to stand up where everyone could have a good squeeze at him. Then Jesus turned to the lawyers and said, Okay then, what will the law let you do on a day off, hurt or help? To make someone's life better or worse? After he looked everyone straight in the eye, Jesus said to the bloke, Stretch out your crook hand. He did. And of course, it wasn't crook anymore. It was perfectly okay. At this, the lawyers were mad as a cut snake with Jesus, muttering, We've got to do something about this bloke. Jesus picks his team. Jesus used, used to nick off up to the high country to pray. He prayed all night long. And then in the morning, he called his mates together. From them, he chose the twelve to be the leaders. He picked Simon and nicknamed him Peter. His brother Andy, another pair of brothers, Jim and John, and Phil and Bart and Matt and Tom, and another Jim, whose old man was named Alf. Another Simon, this bloke used to belong to the People's Democratic Action Front. And Judas, whose dad was an old bloke named Jim. And Judas Iscariot, the snake in the grass. On the road. Jesus and his chosen team leaders, the Twelve, came down to the lower slopes. He was joined there by heaps of his other mates and a huge mob of people from all over the shop, from Judea Shire and Jerusalem and the beach resorts of Tyre and Sidon. Heaps of them were sick as dogs and came to be healed, which they were. Some had really bad spirits and those got fixed too. Everyone just wanted to touch him because when they did, it was like high voltage power shot out of him and into them, and they were healed. The master class begins. Jesus said to his mates, You're well off if you're poor, because God's kingdom is yours. You're well off if you're hungry, because later you'll be satisfied. You're well off if your heart's broken now, because later you'll smile. You're well off when blokes hate you, and turn their backs on you and make fun of you because of me. You ought to be pleased when that happens, tickled pink in fact, because your payoff is stacked up in heaven. The prophets, back in the old days, got the exact same treatment. But look out if you're rich. You've got all your goodies now, so there's nothing good coming for you. Look out if you're fat and well fed now, there's starvation in your future. Look out when everyone and his dog says what a top bloke you are and how bad they used to go on about the prophets who told lies back in the old days. So what does that say about you, hey? Play straight. Jesus said, This is the good word for anyone who bother to listen. Be a good mate even to blokes who are rotten to you. Be a cobber 
even if they stab you in the back. If someone gives you curry, be nice to him. Ask God to be nice to someone who gives you heaps. If someone wallops you, let him do it again. If someone wants your jacket, give him the shirt off your back too. Put your hand in your pocket for everyone who wants a handout. If someone takes all your stuff, don't get cheesed off. And ask for it back. Treat everyone like a mate. And the way you'd like a mate to treat you. If you're only a mate to those who are a mate to you, what's the big deal in that? Even cadgers and trouts do that. You don't win brownie points with trade-offs, like I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. If you lend someone a quid, just so they'll buy you a beer, what's so great about that? Even a tea leaf, that means a thief, will lend you a quid, will lend a quid to another tea leaf. If he thinks there's something in it for him, be a real cobber to everyone, even the crooks and whinges, and open your wallet even for the deadbeats. Then you'll be showing a sort of family resemblance to God, and there's a payoff in that. Be open-handed, just like God is open-handed. Jesus said, Don't go around running people down, or the same thing will happen to you. Forgive and forget when someone messes you about, then God will forgive and forget when you mess him about. Don't be stingy with everything you do for others, because these things boomerang. Paint me a picture. Jesus also used some word pictures. He said, Picture one blind bloke leading another. They'll both wind up down the bottom of a gully. An apprentice is not better than a tradesman, but if he pays attention, he'll end up as a tradesman himself. How come you can spot a speck of dust in, a, in your mate's eye and miss a telegraph pole in your own eye? How come you'll say, Hey mate, let me get... How come you'll say, Hey mate... Let me get that speck of dust out of your eye when you've got a dirty great telegraph pole or railway sleeper in your own eye. Come off it. First take the lump out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to take the speck out of your mate's eye. Rotten fruit doesn't grow on decent trees. You don't pick apples off orange trees or blackberries off grapevines. A decent bloke's okay because his heart's in the right place. But a snake in the grass has a scheming heart. What a bloke says, and does, and thinks, shows what's really going on in his heart. What's the point of calling me boss, or chief, if you don't follow my orders? The bright bloke and the buff head. Jesus said, Everyone who lends an ear to what I say, and then puts it into practice, turns around and changes how they live, is like a smart bloke who built his homestead on a good foundation of rock. A cyclone hit, and that could blow the thoughts right out of your head. It was a lazy wind. Wouldn't it blow around you? Blow straight through you? But wind, rain, whatever, that house on the rock foundations was safe. But everyone who lends an ear to what I say, and then doesn't put it into practice just goes on like they've always done. Is like a real buffhead who has built his homestead on a foundation of sand. S same cyclone hits, and there wasn't one board left nailed to another when the wind and rain was over. They were picking up bits of it in broom. That homestead is a real goner. Jesus' authority is recognised. When he knocked off from his teaching session, Jesus went into Capernaum, where he met an army major who had a servant who was real crook. One foot in the grave. So the, ma so the major asked some of his leading Jews to have a word with Jesus, some of the leading Jews to have a word with Jesus, and ask him to heal the servant. They said, please help him. This major is a decent sort. He's been a mate to us and built our meeting house for us. So Jesus went with them. And when he was within spitting distance of the house, the major sent someone out to say, Sir, 
I shouldn't be mucking you about like this. I'm not worth all this trouble. That's why I didn't come myself and why you shouldn't come to my house. You just give the order and say the word and my bloke will be okay. I'm in the army. I know what it's like. When I give an order to one of my soldiers, he snaps to attention, salutes, and does it. Jesus heard these words and was pretty impressed. All over the shop, he said. I've never found anyone who trusted me like this. The major's mates went back into the house and found the servant fit as a fiddle. Cancel that death certificate. Soon, Jesus and his followers were on the road to the township of Nain, and the whole mob tagged along with them. On the outskirts of the town, they came across a, fu a funeral procession. The dead man was... His widowed was was his widowed mum's only son. She was there, and half the town was with her. When Jesus saw her, he felt really sorry for her, and said, "Dry your eyes." Then he walked up to the coffin, to the open coffin, and said, "Young fella, up." The dead man sat up, looked around, and started to talk. Jesus gave the young bloke back to his mum. Suddenly, everyone just froze in their tracks and, and then thanked God for what had happened. They said, You little beauty, isn't God Bonza? And this Jesus bloke here is straight from God. Everyone knew what had just happened. Even the dogs were barking it all over the countryside. John the Baptist again. John the Baptist was told by his mates what the bush telegraph was saying about Jesus. So he sent a couple of them to ask Jesus, Are you it? Are you the promised one? Or should we stick around for someone else? So they rocked up to Jesus and said, John the Baptist sent us. He said to ask, Are you it? Are you the promised one? Or should we stick around for someone else? At the time, Jesus was busy healing as busy as a one-armed paper hanger in a gale, dealing with every kind of sickness in the medical dictionary. Jesus replied, Just tell John what you've seen. Cripples up on their feet, blind bl blokes seeing, deaf blokes hearing, lepers clean, dead blokes out of the grave and walking around, and God's message, God's good news, being announced. And let me tell you this, well off is a bloke who's not crabby or spitting the dummy about me. When those two had nicked off to deliver the reply, Jesus talked to the mob about John. What did you go out to the bush to see, he said, when you crowded around John to see a blade of past palum waving in the wind? No. Then what did you go to see? Someone dressed up like a pox doctor's clerk? These sorts are in the towns, staying in the best pubs. So what did you go to see? A messenger from God? Too right. And more than just any messenger, John is the is the one on John is the one God's book talks about in these words. I'm sending my messenger ahead of you to get things ready for you. John is the first, number one ahead of everyone who's ever lived, but even the littlest kitty in God's, God's kingdom is ahead of John. Now just about everyone had listened to John. Even the corrupt tax collectors on the fiddle had done the right thing by changing their ways and asking John to baptize them. But the Pharisees and their self-righteous mates had turned their backs on God and refused to be baptized by John. Jesus went on, What can I compare you lot with? You're little kids in a bad mood who can't be pleased. You're like kids sitting on the veranda shouting to each other. We played the fiddle and you wouldn't dance. We sang sad songs and you wouldn't cry. John wouldn't go to your barbies or crack a tinny with you. So you said, He's got a devil of a spirit in him. He's mad. But I turn up at Barbie's and have a glass of Chardonnay with you and say, 
I eat like a pig and drink like a fish, on top of which you say I've got a, I've got really rough friends and hang out with the wrong crowd. Do you, th- do you think that's wise? Do you think that's all that's smart? Simon the Pharisee. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to pop in for a bit for a bite to eat. So he went and joined the others in the backyard around the barbecue. A Sheila, with a reputation as a town bike, heard he was there and went to the house taking a bottle of cologne with her. Seeing Jesus, she cried buckets. She washed his, washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet and put the cologne on them. Now when the Pharisee, the host of the party, saw this, he said to himself, If this Jesus bloke really was a messenger from God, he'd know what sort of Sheila this is. He'd know her reputation is as rough as bags. Jesus said to the Pharisee, Simon, old son, I have something to say to you. Sure, what is it? Simon replied. Picture this. Two blokes owe some dough to a pawnbroker. One owes 500 quid and the other 50. Neither of them has a brass razoo. Neither can pay. The the pawnbroker says they don't have to. He just tears up their IOUs. Which of them will be really tickled? The Pharisee replied, the one who owned the big bickies. Too right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, When I arrived, you didn't give me the usual water and towel to wash my hands. But this woman has washed my feet with tears and dried them with her hair and kissed them and even put expensive cologne on them. Her wrongdoings, of which there are heaps, are forgiven. You can understand why she's beside herself with gratitude. But the bloke who is not forgiven much doesn't care much. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your wrongdoings are forgiven. Simon's friends said to each other, Who does this bloke think he is for giving people like this? Jesus said to the woman, Because you trusted in me, you are forgiven. I give you God's peace, peace of heart. John the Baptist, his story ends. King Herod had John the Baptist collared by the wallopers and chucked in the local lockup because of his sister-in-law, Herodias, his brother Phil's better half. Herod was dead keen on this bird, and she stacked up with him, and she shacked up with him. John said, What you've done is wrong. It's not on. This made Herodias as mad as a cut snake, and she wanted John knocked off. But Herod was nervous because although John was a wowser, he was a good bloke. And even though Herod was confused by what John said, he was glad to be earbashed by him. Then Herod chucked a birthday wingding for himself and invited all the toffs and bigwigs. When Herodias' daughter came in and bunged on a show, danced for the party crowd, Herod was dead pleased. He said to the young Sheila, Name it and you can have it. Up to the half the acreage. Anything. Just ask. So this bird went and asked her mum, What do you reckon I ought to ask for? And with an evil glint in her eye, her mum said, The head of John the Baptist. So she toddled back into the party room and said, I want, right now, on a plate, the head of John the Baptist. This rattled old Herod, but he'd made the promise in front of everyone and was stuck with it. He didn't muck about, but straight away sent a big beefy sergeant down to the lockup to do the deed. Back came John the Baptist's head on a plate. Herod gave it to the young Sheila, who gave it to her mum. When John's followers heard, they came and collected the corpse and gave it a decent burial. A gigantic picnic. Jesus said to his team, Come on out to the desert for a bit, so you can have some kip. There was such a big mob hanging around, they didn't even have time to have a bite to eat. They hopped in the skiff and rowed around the shore to a quiet spot in the scrub. 
But the mob saw them leave and recognized them and took off on foot. So people from all the townships got there ahead of them. When Jesus came ashore, he saw this enormous mob and felt sorry for them because they were like a bunch of aimless sheep with no one to keep an eye on them. He started talking to them and gave them the good oil on a whole lot of things. Late in the Arvo, his team came to him and said, This is dry Mali country and it's getting pretty late. Let the mob pop off so they can buy themselves some tucker from local prop- properties and townships. Jesus said, You feed them. They protested, Do you want us to spend 200 smackers to buy enough bread for this lot? He said, Well, how much bread is there? Go and check. They did so and said, Five little pannikin loaves of damper and a couple of fish. Jesus ordered them all to sit down, in groups, on the cattle grass. The team ran around like kelpies and got them into groups of hundreds and fifties. Meanwhile, he took the damper and the fish, looked up to heaven, thanked God for the food, and broke the damper into bits, giving the bits to his team to share out. He did the same with the fish. Everyone in the mob tucked into the bread and the fish until they couldn't eat any more. Then they picked up the scraps, a dozen baskets full. There were about 500 blokes in that mob. Don't try this in your backyard pool. Jesus told his team to get into their boat straight away and row across Bethsaida on the other side while he sent the mob packing. Having said toodaloo to them, he went up into the hills to pray. After dark, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was by himself on the shore. He could see they were in trouble, straining on the oars, struggling into the wind. In the early hours of the morning, Jesus came across the lake. He was walking on the water and about to pass the boat. When the team saw him walking on water, they thought they'd seen a ghost. They yelped with surprise and were scared witless. Jesus said to them, Calm down and cheer up, it's me. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind died down. They were knocked sideways. They were slow on the uptake and didn't understand the meaning of what Jesus had done with the damper and the fish. Or maybe they didn't want to understand. Surgery is open. They crossed over the lake to Gennesaret Shire and dropped the anchor. When the team came ashore, the locals recognized Jesus straight off and ran around like overexcited chooks. The locals stretched down all the sickies they could find to where they'd heard he was. Whether in towns or cities or in the bush, the locals would whip, whip, whip up all the sickies into the main street where they begged Jesus just to let them touch the edge of his coat. And everyone that got touched got better. The old fogies. A mob of Pharisees and lawyers from the big smoke from Jerusalem circled around Jesus, having a go at him because they said his team didn't wash their hands before eating their tucker. The Pharisees lived the way their Jewish mummers had taught them to live. They were dead kosher, washing their hands, having a bath after going to the markets, washing their cups and saucers and all the rest of the rules. These blokes asked Jesus, Why is your team not strictly kosher like us? What's so hard about washing your hands already? Jesus replied, Back in the old days, Isaiah got it right when he said, You're a bunch of shallow show-offs. In God's book it says, Their religion is all mouth and no trousers. Their religion is a useless show. They flog their own ideas like, It's God's truth. You turn your backs on God and push your own rules. Didn't Moses tell you to respect your mum and dad? And didn't he say that anyone who was as good, who didn't, was as good as dead? But you twist this by saying that if a bloke's got something that would help his mum and dad, he can say it's been promised to God, and then he doesn't have to help them. In heaps of ways, just like that, 
you've twisted God's message with your own little rules. Unclean, unclean. Jesus called the mob together and said, Open your ears and pay attention. It's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean in God's eyes, but what comes out. Get it? After Jesus had slipped into a bungalow away, from the mob his team said they didn't get it and what did he mean jesus said still a bit slow on the uptake eh look the tucker you eat can't make you unclean it goes into your tummy not your heart then though then through the guts and down the sewer by this jesus meant that all types of tucker was okay to eat then jesus said it's what comes out of the inner you that makes you unclean. It's inside yourself that you cook up evil thoughts, vulgar deeds, stealing, murder, adultery, greed, meanness, deceit, perving, envy, rudeness, pride, and sheer stupidity. It's this stuff inside your head that looks to God like disgusting filth. Everybody needs good neighbours. One of the lawyers chipped in to test Jesus with a question. Teacher, this smart Alex, this smart Alex said, What I gotta do to score eternal life? Jesus replied, What's in God's book? How do you read it? The lawyer shrugged his shoulders and said, Well, you know, the Bible says Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It also says, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Spot on, Jesus responded. Do that and you'll score eternal life. Sticking out his chest with a smart gleam in his eye, the lawyer said, All right then, just who is my neighbor? Answer me that. Jesus replied by telling a story. A certain bloke was taking the Jerusalem road to Jericho. A bunch of bush rangers attacked him, stole his dough, and left him as good as dead. A big wig from the temple happened to pass by, took one look at the bloke, crossed the road and hurried off. Another official who was on the road that day did the same. Then a really ordinary bloke, a grubby old street sweeper you wouldn't look twice at, passed by and felt really sorry for him. So he used his first aid kit to patch him up and then put him on his old nag, took him to the nearest pub and took care of him. The next day he gave the barman some dough and said, look after this bloke and if he costs more than this, I'll pay the rest on my way back. Then Jesus asked, who was the neighbor in that story? The lawyer said, well, the bloke looked after the victim, I guess. Too right, said Jesus. Now you go and live like that. Who is this bloke? Jesus and the team were visiting the townships around Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. Sorry. As they made their way down the track one day, Jesus said to the team, Who do the mob say I am? The team told him, Some blokes say you are John the Baptist. Or maybe that old-timer, Elijah, back again. Other blokes reckon you're one of the prophets. Then Jesus replied and stopped and said, But what do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Christ, the promised one. Then Jesus warned them not to spill the beans to anyone about this just yet. And what's he come to do? Jesus began telling them what was in store for him. Basically, a lot of suffering, rejected by the crew in power, a gruesome death, and then coming back to life again. Jesus spelled it all out. Peter took Jesus to one side and told him to stop saying such horrible things. 
But when he turned around and saw the team all listening, he chipped, he chipped Peter. That's a devilish thing to say. Look at it from God's point of view, not the spin doctors. Then he called everyone who was traveling with him and the team and said, If you want to follow me, forget about yourself. Take up your cross and follow in my footsteps. If you want to save your life, then give it away. Whoever gives up his life for me and for the news about me will end up with more life than he can imagine. What would be the point of getting the world but losing yourself in the process? What price would you pay for your own soul? Don't turn your back on me and my message because of the know-it-alls and cynics around you. If you do, I'll turn my back on you when the day comes for me to stand in God's glory and power. The truth is that there are some people here today who will see the glory and power before they die. Cosmic power on display. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, Jim and John with him up into the high country where they did see his cosmic glory and power. Jesus changed in front of their eyes. It was like something out of a movie, as though he was filled with light, dazzling like the sun itself. Then two heroes from the old days, Moses and Elijah, came into view beside Jesus, talking to him. Peter blurted out, Master, it's terrific to be here. Let's, uh, let's mark these three spots uh, for you and Moses and Elijah. Peter didn't have a clue what to say because, like the others, he was terrified. Suddenly, there was a huge billowing cloud overhead and from deep inside the cloud came a voice saying, This is my beloved son. When he speaks, listen. Then, just as suddenly, they were all alone again. And the three of them could see Jesus could only see Jesus and the mountainside. On the way down, Jesus told them not to breathe a word about this until after he'd come back to life. So they kept it to themselves. But they argued with each other about what he might, have, what he might mean by come back to life. They asked Jesus, Why do the Bible teachers say that Elijah has to turn up first before the Christ, the promised one? Jesus said, they're right about Elijah, they're right that Elijah comes first. But what does the Bible say about the promised one? That he'll suffer badly and be treated with contempt. Well, Elijah did come and they gave him the rough end of the stick too. A sick boy. When they got back down to where the rest of the team was, they saw a mob surrounding them and some religious bigwigs arguing with them. The mob was surprised to see Jesus and ran up to say g'day. He asked, What's all this about? One of the blokes said, Master, I brought my son to see you. He's been invaded by a spirit that tops him speaking, and when he gets an attack, that stops him speaking, and when he gets an attack, he has a fit and foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and then becomes rigid. I asked your team to get rid of the invading spirit, and they were dead useless. Jesus said, What's wrong with you people? You've got no trust at all, have you? You're a real troll, you are. Bring the kid here. They brought the kid over. But as soon as the spirit saw Jesus, he threw the kid into convulsions, thrashing about like mad. Jesus asked the boy's dad, How long has he been like this? Ever since he was a toddler, the man replied. It's really destructive. It's thrown him into fires and into water quite often. Please, please help us if you can. Jesus replied, What's this if business? Anything is possible when you trust me. The boy's dad said, I do trust you. A bit. Help me trust you a lot. Completely and totally. 
When Jesus saw more and more people crowding about, he gave the invading spirit a blast. Out! That's an order. And never come back. The spirit made the kids scream and tremble, and then left. The boy fainted, and everyone said he'd cocked it. But Jesus took his hand and helped him up. When Jesus and the team were alone, they asked, Why would, couldn't we do that? It needs prayer, Jesus replied. A total dependence on God. Death again. Jesus and his team set off through Galilee Shire, not telling anyone where they were going because he was teaching his team. He said, I'm going to be betrayed to some people, enemies of God. I'll be murdered and three days later come back to life. The team didn't know what he meant, but they were afraid to ask. The Tale of the Lost Sheep Con men, lily whackers, and lowlifes hung around listening to Jesus. So the Pharisees and the lawyers started whinging. This bloke mixes with the scum. He'll even have a pizza with them. So Jesus told them this story. What sort of bloke who has a flock of 100 sheep and lost one of them wouldn't leave the other 99 in the home yard and search the paddocks until he found the missing merino. And when he gets back home, he'll say, Hey, let's crack a tinny. I found that merino of mine that went missing. Jesus said, Just like that, there's more barracking and cheering in heaven over one wrongdoer who turns back to God than over 99 who think they don't have to. The Tale of the Lost Coin Jesus told the people another story. What will an old lady do if her life savings consists of 10 coins and she loses one of them? She'll turn on all the lights and sweep out the place like she's never done before and look in every corner till she finds it. Then she'll call up all the other old ladies and say, Guess what? I found that coin that I'd lost. Jesus said, Just like that, God's angels are tickled pink when even one person turns back to him. The Tale of the Lost Son Then Jesus told the people another story. This bloke had two sons. The, eldest, the youngest said, Dad, how about letting me have my half of what I'll get in your will right now? So the old man shared out his property between the two boys. The youngest immediately sold half and took off for distant parts where he had a wild time while the money just ran through his fingers. When he was broke, a drought hit that spot, and pretty soon he was on the breadline. He got a job feeding slops to pigs, and was so hungry, he would have been happy to eat the slops himself. He finally came to his senses and said, My dad's farm hands live better than this. I'll go back home and say, Dad, I've done the wrong thing by you and by God. I'm not good enough to be a son of yours anymore. But I'll come back and work for you as a farmhand. That's if you'll have me. So he set off. His home farm was still a long way down the road when his dad spotted him, ran to him and hugged him and shook his hand. The boy said, Dad, I've done the wrong thing by you and by God. I'm not good enough to be a son of yours anymore. But his dad called out, Hey, get out. Get out some clean clothes for this boy and some decent shoes. Heat up the barbie and crack a keg. My boy was as good as dead, but now he's back. He was lost, but here he is. And so they began to party. The boy's big brother was out on the top paddock. And as he rode back home, he could hear the noise at the party. So he called over one of the blokes and said, what's going on here? This bloke explained, your little brother's back home, safe and sound. So your dad's turned on a party, with the spit roast going and a keg and everything. The big brother blew a fuse and refused to even go into the house. His dad came and said, please, come on in. But the big brother whinged, 
for for years I was slaved. For years I was slaved out here and done what you wanted. You never put on a barbie for me and my friends, not even a few lamb chops. Now this boy of yours drags himself back home, having chucked away all his dough and whores, and you do this, the big party, the spit roast, the keg. His dad said, Oh, my son, I do appreciate you. And look around you. All of this is yours. But we've got to have a party today. Your brother was as good as dead. But now he's back. He was lost. But here he is. Jesus hits the big smoke. As Jesus and his team reached the outskirts of Jerusalem, around Bethpage and Bethany at Mount Olive, he sent two of them on ahead. Pop down to the next town, he told them. As soon as you arrive, you'll see a nag, a young horse that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you what's going on, just say, the master needs it, it'll be back soon. They nicked off to the next town and found the nag by a doorway in the main street. Some blokes who were hanging around said, What do you think you're doing with that nag? They repeated what Jesus had said, and the blokes said, All right then. They brought the nag back to Jesus, threw some coats on the back, and Jesus sat on the beast. Some of the mob got excited and threw branches from palm trees, and even their own coats on the ground. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the mob was barracking and cheering. They cheered. On your Jesus. On your God. Go Jesus. He's he's God's promised one. The new King David. On your God. What a beauty. When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem... He went straight to the temple and took a squeeze at everything. But because it was already late in the Arvo, he went back to Bethany on the, with the team. The Fig Tree Next morning on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was feeling peckish. He saw a fig tree with nothing but leaves. It wasn't fig season yet. Jesus said to the tree, You've grown your last fig. The team heard him say it. In the temple. In Jerusalem, Jesus went straight to the temple. There he hid, he did his lolly at all the market stalls. He tipped over their stalls and chased out the dealers. He stopped the carriers carting their goods through the temple. He shouted, The Bible says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a thief's kitchen. The head honchos and their lawyers heard all this and started plotting to have him knocked off. But they were afraid of his popularity because he was such a respected teacher. That evening, Jesus and the team left the city again. The fig tree again. Next morning, they walked walked past the same fig tree and noticed that it was shriveled up, roots and all. Peter remembered what Jesus had said in the day before. He said, Master, look what's happened to the tree you put that curse on. Jesus said to his team, Trust God. If you tell a mountain to shift itself into the sea and trust God, without a shadow of a doubt, it'll happen. So what I'm saying is, when you say your prayers, trust God and he'll give you his very best. And when you do say your prayers, you've got to forgive everyone who's offended you. So that God, your loving Heavenly Father, will forgive you for all the ways you've offended Him. The Lawyers Grilled Jesus Jesus and his team returned to Jerusalem and to the temple. The head honchos and their lawyers came over to him and asked, What right have you got to carry on like this? Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, First I have a question for you. You answer my question. Then I'll answer yours. Who gave John the Baptist the right to baptize? Was it God or was it just his own idea? To put the cat among the pigeons, they said to each other, We can't say it was God or Jesus. We'll ask us why we didn't believe him. 
and let him baptize us. On the other hand, this mob thinks John was a real prophet, so we can't say it was all his own idea. They were scared of the mob, so they told Jesus, We have no idea, actually. Jesus responded, Well, in that case, I won't tell you where my authority comes from. The Nasty Tenants Then Jesus told them this story. A certain squatter had a big property. He put in the stockyards, fences, artesian boars, and the rest. Then he rented the place out to a bunch of tenant farmers and left. At harvest time, he sent his overseer to collect the rent. The tenants grabbed the overseer, gave him a good thrashing, and sent him away empty-handed. The squatter then sent one of his drovers, but they bashed the bloke up too, and gave him a proper tongue lashing. Then the squatter sent another, and this one they actually killed. He kept sending one stockman after another. Some they bashed, some they killed. Finally, the squatter sent his son whom he loved very much. He thought they'd respect his son. But the tenants said to themselves, someday he'll own this property. Let's kill him. Then the whole farm will be ours. So they grabbed the squatter's son and killed him and threw his body out on the road. After telling this story, Jesus said, What do you imagine that squatter will do? You'll come with the, tr the troopers, arrest those tenants, and someone else will get the property. The Bible says, The brick the builders chucked aside has become the most important brick in the building. This is something God has done, and it's staggering. The head honchos knew it was them he was talking about and would have arrested him on the spot, except they were afraid of the mob. So they left him alone and nicked off. Another trick question. The Pharisees put their heads together with some of King Herod's cronies. They sent some blokes to trick Jesus into putting his foot in it. They went to him and said, Teacher, you're an honest man. You don't shape what you say to suit popular opinion. But you tell the truth of God. So then, should we pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus was on to them and said, Trying to catch me out, are you? Show me a coin. They brought him a coin and said, Whose head is stamped on this coin? The emperor's, they said. They brought him a coin and he said, Whose head is stamped on this coin? The emperor's, they said. Caesar's. Spot on, said Jesus, so give Caesar what's his, and give God what's his. They found this pretty much breathtaking. Life after death. The Sadducees are a bunch who don't believe in life after death, so some of them tried to bowl a bouncer at Jesus. Teacher, Moses wrote that if a married man dies and leaves no kiddies, his brother should marry the widow. The idea, the idea being that their first son would then be thought of as the son of the dead brother. Well, there were once seven brothers, see. The first one married and died without the kids. The second brother married his brother's widow. And he also tumbled off the twig without having kids. The same thing happened to the third brother. And finally, to all seven brothers. Not a lucky family, when you think about it. At least the woman, at last the woman died. When God raises people back to life, whose, lo whose wife will this Sheila be? After all, she had been married to all seven of these brothers. Jesus replied, You're as thick as three short planks, and you don't know your Bible, and you don't understand the power of God. When God raises people to life, they're not married, and they don't marry. They're like the angels in heaven. But about this business of life after death, don't you remember from the Bible 
when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living, not the dead. So you're dead wrong. The main rules. A lawyer rolled up while Jesus and the Sadducees were having this argy-bargy. When he heard Jesus giving such neat answers, he asked, What's the most important rule for living? Jesus replied, The top of the list is this. You have only one Lord and God. You must love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. The second... Most important one says, Love others as much as you love yourself. Nothing else matters up to these two. The man responded, Teacher, you're spot on when you say there's only one God, and we ought to love him with the whole of our hearts and brains and energy, and that we ought to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. These things matter more than being done by the priest in some ritual in church. When Jesus heard these sensible words, he said, you're not a million miles away from God's kingdom. After this, no one was game to ask him any questions. The official teachers. When Jesus was giving a talk in the plaza of the temple, he said, How can the officials make out that the Christ, the promised one, is King David's great, 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 etc. grandson? Old David himself given the words by God's Spirit, wrote, The Lord God said to my Lord, Come and stand by me while I make your enemies grovel at your feet. If King David called the Christ his Lord, how can he be David's great-great-great-great-grandson? The mob loved hearing Jesus talk. One of his talks, In one of his talks he said, Keep a weary eye on the official teachers. They like to they like to swan about in the in flash clothes and sit in the box seats at the meeting halls, and they've got a spot on the top table at the best dinner parties. But they'll foreclose on a widow's mortgage and then go and pray a long, loud prayer. They'll really cop it from God. Who gives most? Jesus was sitting near the temple offering box he saw the rich sticking in wads of folding money and and then a widow an old duck on the pension dropping a couple of coins just small change jesus called his team to gather round and said straight up this old lady put in more than all the rest because the rest who kicked the kicked the kitty just stuck in what they could spare while she put in her entire grocery money things to come as they were leaving the temple, one of the team said to him, Don't you just love this building, the design, the huge stones? Jesus replied, Take a good look. It won't last. This place will end up a heap of rubble. Later, Peter, John, Jim, and Andy came to Jesus on Mount Olive, on the slope facing the temple, and asked, When will this destruction happen? Will there be any warning signs? Jesus replied, Keep your eyes open. Don't let anyone fool you. Lots of blokes will bung on an act and say, Jesus sent me. People will be fooled. When the news is full of wars and warmongering, don't lose your head. These things happen, but it's not the end of the world. One lot will attack another and then be attacked themselves. There'll be earthquakes, famines, all that stuff. But that's just the beginning, not the end. But watch it. You'll be arrested and dragged into court. Or even or, or given a really tough time for the meeting halls, in the meeting halls. Sometimes you'll be dragged before tin pot presidents and power mad magistrates. Stand up for me and my message. Before the end comes, the message about me has to be told around the world. When you're dragged before some tribunal, don't panic. Don't get nervous about what to say, because God can speak through you. 
He can put words in your mouth. Your own relatives will betray you and families will be divided. Everyone will look on you as some sort of mug because of me and my message. But if you stick with me to the bitter end, you'll be okay and okay forever. When a real monster turns up, don't hang around. Work out what this means for yourself. People in Judea, when the monster arrives, should clear off to the hills. If you're working on the roof, don't go back into the house. Just go. If you're out in the paddock, don't go back for your stuff. Just go. For expectant mums and nursing mums, it'll be terrible. Just pray it doesn't happen in the dead of winter. What's coming at that time, in this place, will be the worst time in the world, ever. Unless God cuts it short, no one will survive. But for the sake of this, of his faithful few, God will cut it short. In some, If some clown says, here's the promised one, or there he is, use your loaf and don't believe him. Because pretenders and liars will turn up doing signs and wonders and trying to lead even God's faithful few down a blind alley. So be on your guard and don't say I haven't warned you. Before the end is written. Jesus told them, Before the suffering will end, the sun itself will descend. Alarm bells will chime, yet the moon will not shine. The whole cosmos will cry and stars fall from the sky. Then, said Jesus, then I'll be seen, surrounded by clouds of power and glory. I shall send out my messengers to gather my people from the four corners of the world, from all over the shop. There's a lesson to be learned from the humble fig tree. Its new leaves tell you a summer's coming. When you see all this happening, you'll know the clock is ticking, and the countdown has begun. And you will see it happen. Remember, even planets and suns finally die, but my words live forever. And no one knows when the end gets written in, in the big book. Not the angels, not even me. God alone knows, and that's a fact. So, stay on your toes and keep your eyes open. It's like when the boss goes away on a trip and leaves the staff in charge. Each with their own job to do. Stick to your duty and keep your eyes peeled because you don't know when the boss is coming back. It might be tomorrow or the day after or next week or whenever. So don't slack off. Pass this message on to everyone else and stay alert. The death plot begins. It was now two days before the big do called the Passover. And the head honchos and lawyers put their heads together to cook up a way to lay their hands on Jesus and have him killed. They said, we've got to watch out what we do during the big festival because the mob might go bananas. Meanwhile, Jesus was having dinner at Simon's home in Bethany. Simon, the one who used to have leprosy. During it, during dinner, Sheila came up with a bottle of this really expensive perfume. She opened it up and splashed the contents of the bottle on Jesus. All around the table, people complained. What a waste! That could have been sold for a stack of dough and given to the poor. But Jesus said, Let her alone. This is a good thing she's done. You can look after the poor anytime. But I won't always be here. She... She's done what she could. She's prepared my body ahead of time for its burial. And honestly, wherever this message about me is heard around the world, what she's done today will be heard about too. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the team, went slinking off to the head honchos to turn Jesus in. They were delighted and offered him a blank check, so he promised to keep his eyes open for the right moment. A last meal together. It was the first day of the festival when they traditionally ate the Lebanese bread and roast lamb. The team said to Jesus, Where are we having dinner? Jesus said to two of the team, 
Pop into the city and you'll see a bloke carrying a drum of water. Follow him. See which house he goes into and say to the owner, The master sent us to check the guest house for tonight's dinner. He'll take you upstairs, show you a large dining room. You can get the dinner ready there. The two went into town and it happened just the way Jesus said. So they prepared the dinner. That night Jesus and the rest of the team joined them. While they were eating, Jesus said, One of the blokes at this table is planning to betray me. This plunged the team into gloom, and they said things like, Surely not, not me at least. Jesus said, It's one of the team, one who's eating with me right now. I will die, just as the Bible predicted, but it will be hard yards for my betrayer. It would be better for that bloke if he'd never been born. While they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread, broke it, and gave thanks to God for it, and said, My body is just like this bread. And he gave to them. Then he poured out a glass of wine, gave thanks to God for it. And as he handed the wine around, said, This wine is like my blood, which is poured out for many people. The blood that seals my last will and testament. This is the last glass of wine I'll have until I drink new wine in God's kingdom. Then they sang a song together and went out to Mount Olive. Peter's boast. Jesus said to the team, You'll all fail, fail me. The Bible predicts, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I come back to life again, I'll meet you in Galilee. Peter protested. The rest of them might fail you, but not me. Jesus said to him, Honestly, before sunrise, before the rooster crows twice, three times you'll deny even knowing me. Peter spluttered, But, but, I'll die before I do that. And the others said the same thing. Jesus prays. Jesus and his team came to a spot among the olive trees called Gethsemane. He said to them, Wait here for me while I go and pray. He took Peter, John, and Jim with him. His heart was in his boots. I feel like death, he said. Stay here and keep me company. He went on a little further alone and then sank to the ground and began to pray as if it were at all possible that he was facing what, what he was facing would not happen. Father, Father, he, he groaned, can you do anything? Can I avoid this horror that's coming? But in the end, it's got to be what you want, not what I want. Finally, he returned to the other tr three and found them sleeping. Peter, he said, asleep? Was an hour too long to ask you to wait? Stay on guard and pray, or you'll be overwhelmed. I'm sure the spirit is willing, enough. But mere flesh and blood is weak. He went off again and prayed the same prayer using the same words. And when he returned again, he found them sound asleep. This time they were embarrassed and didn't know what to say. Then a third time it happened. And when he returned, James, Jesus said, Still sleeping? Enough. This is it. The time has come for me to be handed over to the evil schemers. Let's go. The traitor's almost here. The arrest. As he said these words, Judas, the traitor, arrived leading a mob of blokes armed to the teeth with swords and clubs. They'd been sent by the head honchos and the lawyers. Jesus, the, Judas, the traitor, had tipped them off. Arrest the bloke I walk straight up to and kiss on the cheek. He's the one. Grab him and put him under guard. So Judas walked straight up to Jesus. And said, Master, and kissed him on the cheek. The guards rushed forward and grabbed Jesus by the arms. One of Jesus' team, Peter, swung a sword wildly and lopped off the ear of one of the guards, one who was on the staff of the high priest. Jesus said, Am I 
am I some sort of thug or blagger that you would have come out armed to the teeth to arrest me? I've been down in the temple giving talks every day and you could have arrested me there. But it's happened this way to fulfill the predictions in the Bible. At what point, at that point, all the remaining members of Jesus' team turned tail and ran. One was a young bloke who was wearing only a toga. When the guards grabbed his grabbed at his toga, he left it behind and ran off naked. The trial part one. They took Jesus off to the high priest's palace, where the head honchos, the community leaders, and the lawyers were gathered waiting for him. Peter followed at a distance. In the palace courtyard, the guards had built a small campfire, and Peter sat down with them there to keep warm. Inside, the whole council was trying to find a scrap of evidence against Jesus so they could ask for the death penalty, but they were having trouble. The professional perjurers they lined up kept contradicting each other. Finally, some blokes who couldn't lie straight in bed got up and said, We heard this character say he'd pull down our temple and that he'd have that in three days that he'd magically build another one. But they still couldn't get their story straight. Then the high priest got up and said to Jesus, Well, what about it? Have you got anything to say for yourself? Jesus said nothing. So the high priest said, Well, are you or are you not the Christ, the promised one? Are you or are you not God's own son? Jesus said, I am. And you shall see me in my glory and power lifted up into the clouds. At this, the high priest spat his dummy and did his lolly completely. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Who needs witnesses? You heard what he said. He insulted God. Come on. What do you say about that? And they all voted for the death penalty. Then these community leaders gathered around Jesus and began to spit on him and punch him. They blindfolded him and slapped him and said, Prophesy then, go on, who hit you? They were still hitting him as they led him away. Peter's cowardice. Meanwhile, Peter was around the fire in the courtyard below. A girl who worked in the kitchen saw him and said, I know you. I've seen you hanging around with that Jesus from Nazareth. Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he protested. And you don't know what you're talking about either. He moved a bit further away, but the girl said to some of the guards, This bloke's one of them. Peter shook his head and said, No, not a chance. But then one of the guards said, You've got that funny accent. You are from Galilee. Peter began to curse and swear, just like a fisherman, and, and half shouted, I don't even know this bloke you're talking about. At that moment, a rooster crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered those words of Jesus, before sunrise, before the rooster crows twice, three times you'll deny even knowing me. Peter rushed out into the darkness and broke down in tears. The Trial, Part 1, Part 2 At the crack of dawn, the head honchos, the community leaders, and the lawyers held a formal meeting as a council. They had Jesus tied up and marched him off to the governor, Pilate. The governor said to Jesus, Well then, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You said it. Pilate said, Just give me a straight answer. Look at the sta- at the charge sheet they've brought against you. But Jesus said nothing further, and Pilate was puzzled. During the festival, Pilate al- always released one prisoner, just to please the mob. At the time, this his army had a bloke named Barabbas locked up. He'd been arrested as a terrorist and charged with murder. The crowd started yelling <clears throat> that it was festival time, time for Pilate to set a prisoner free. So, Pilate asked him, What about this bloke here? Do you want me to set free the king of the Jews? But the head honchos 
had their renter crowd mingled through the mob, and they all yelled out for Barabbas to be released. All right then, said Pilate. What? But what about this other one, the one you tell me is the king of the Jews? Kill him, the mob screamed. Kill him. But what's he done? shouted Pilate. I can't figure it out. What on earth has he done? But the mob set up a chant of, Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. Governor Pilate wanted to please the crowd, so he released Barabbas, had Jesus whipped, and then passed the death sentence on him. The Execution The Roman soldiers led Jesus inside the courtyard of the governor's palace, where they called out the whole regiment. They dressed him up in fancy dress, something like a king's robe, and put a pretend crown made of thorns, branches on his head. Then they danced around, mocked him, and made fun of him. Oh, the king of the Jews, oh dear king, they hooted. They, they hit him, spat on him, then knelt down and pretended to worship him. When they'd had their fun, they took the fancy dress off him, put him in his own clothes again, and the execution squad marched him out. On the way, they grabbed a bloke out of the crowd, a visitor from Cyrene, called Simon, the dad of Alex and Rufus, and made him carry the wooden cross. They brought Jesus to Skull Rock, the execution site. They, off they offered him drugged wine, but he knocked it back. They nailed him to the wooden cross. The execution squad played dice to see who'd get which bit of clothing. It was nine o'clock in the morning. They tacked a sign to his cross showing the charge against him. It said, The King of the Jews. Jesus was, ex Jesus was executed between two thieves, one on either side. And the crowd made fun of Jesus, jeering, Hey you! who can knock down temples and rebuild them in three days. Show us how smart you are. Get off the cross. Come on down. The head honchos and the lawyers were there, having their bit of fun, saying to each other, He rescued others. Let's see him rescue himself. Let's see this king of the Jews get off his cross. Of course, if you do that, O promised one, then we'll believe you. And the dying thieves joined in the mockery. The Death At midday, the sky turned dark, and the shadow remained until three o'clock in the afternoon. At about that time, Jesus cried out in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you left me? Someone in the mob said, Listen, he's calling out to Elijah. Another man got some wine in a sponge and held it up for him to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah comes and takes him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. At that moment, the great curtain of the inner temple tore in two from top to bottom. The sergeant in charge of the execution squad Standing right in front of Jesus, saw him die and said, It's true. This man was the son of God. At the back of the crowd were some Galilean women who had come to Jerusalem with Jesus. Mary Magdalene, Mary, Jim and John's mum, Salome, and others. The burial. It was nearly sunset, and everything was about to shut down for the official day off. The bloke from Arimathea, named Joseph, a member of the city council and a devout bloke who looked forward to God's kingdom, had the gumption to go to Governor Pilate and to ask him to be given the body of Jesus. The governor was a bit startled to hear that Jesus was already dead, so he called in the sergeant from the execution squad to check. When the sergeant reported that he double-checked that Jesus was really dead, dead as a doornail, Pilate said Joseph could have the body. Joseph brought a long burial sheet, took the body down from the cross, wrapped the body in the sheet, and buried it in a nearby tomb, newly cut.
in the rock. He rolled a heavy stone in place to seal the tomb. The two Marys who'd seen Jesus die were there and saw the burial. Jesus is alive. On Sunday morning, before sunrise, Mary Magdalene set off for the tomb. She found the heavy stone that had sealed the entrance rolled away. At this, at this, she, she took off like a rabbit and ran back to where the team was staying. She found Peter and the other team member who was a good mate of Jesus and puffed out. He's gone. Someone's taken him and I don't know where. Peter and the other bloke took off for the tomb at top speed. The other bloke got there first and looked inside. Sure enough, apart from the burial sheet, the tomb was empty. Then Peter caught up, went inside and saw the empty tomb and the burial sheet and the cloth that had been wound around the head of the corpse laying separately. The other bloke came in after Peter, saw all of this, and when he, and he was the first one to believe what had happened, even though at the time they didn't understand that the Bible said Jesus would come back from the dead. Mary sees Jesus. Mary was standing in the garden, outside the tomb, crying her eyes out. Still crying, she stooped down and looked inside. She saw two angels in white, one sitting where the head would have been and the other where the feet would have been. Now then, they said, why all these tears? They've taken him, she sobbed. The master's been taken and I don't know where. As she said this, she turned back to the garden and saw Jesus standing there without knowing it was Jesus. Now then, he said to her, why all these tears? Who are you looking for? Taking him for the gardener, she sobbed, Oh, please, if you took him, just tell me where, and I'll come and fetch him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to face him and cried out, Teacher? He said, Now, now, don't, be, don't cling to me like that. I've got to go. I've got to go to the Father. But you whiz back to the team, and tell them that I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary rushed back and told the others what she, that she'd seen the master, and she told them what she'd said, what he'd said. Others see Jesus. That same day, a Sunday, at sunset, when the team was in hiding in the house with all the doors shut because they were afraid of the temple authorities, Jesus came. He stood in the middle of the room, greeted them with the word, Peace and then showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were beside themselves with excitement and happiness to see the master. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you, adding, Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Taking a deep breath, he said, Receive my spirit. If you forgive someone's wrongdoings, they're forgiven. If you don't, they aren't. Thomas sees Jesus. Although Thomas, who was a twin, was one of the team, he wasn't with them that night. So when the others said, Hey, we've seen the Lord, Tom said, Pull the other leg, unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and touch them, and the wound in his side too, I just won't believe it. Eight days later, they were together again, and Tom was with them this time. And Jesus came, even through the door, even though the doors were shut, and stood in the middle of the team and greeted them. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Come on, reach out your hand and touch these wounds in my hand and my side. Give up your niggling doubts and trust me. Thomas was gobsmacked and said, You are my Lord and my God. Jesus said, You trust me because you've seen me. But really well off are those who haven't seen me, but trust me just the same. The Purpose All of this has been written down so that you can trust Jesus as the promised one, the Christ, God's own Son. And so that by trusting Him personally, you can have real life with God starting here and now and going on forever. 
His mates see Jesus. A bit later, Jesus' mates saw him on the shore of Lake Tiberias. It was like this. There was a bunch of them there. Peter, Tom, Nathan, the two Zebedee boys, and a couple of others. Peter said, I'm going to do a spot of fishing, lads. Good idea, said the others. We'll come too. So they went out to the boat, fished all night, and didn't catch a tiddler. After sunrise the next morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but they didn't recognize him. He called out, Caught anything? Nope, not a thing, they shouted. So he called out, Drop your net over the right side of the boat and try again. They did what he said, and this time the net was so full they couldn't pull the thing back into the boat. John said to Peter, Hey, it's the Lord. Then when Peter heard it was the Lord, he grabbed the coat he'd taken off, when he was working, jumped into the water and headed for shore. The others stayed in the boat about 100 meters out and dragging the net full behind them, rowed back in. When they landed, they found a campfire going and fish and bread already cooking. Jesus said, fetch some of the fish you've just caught. It was Peter who dragged the net up on to the shore. They counted the fish, 153 whoppers, and the net didn't rip. Come on, Jesus said. Breakfast's on. None of them was game enough to say, who are you, knowing it was him. Jesus shared out the fresh bread and the barbecued fish. This was the third time they'd seen him since he'd come back from the dead. Jesus and Peter. After breakfast, Jesus turned to Peter and asked, Peter Johnson, do you love me more than these others do? Peter said, You bet, too right. Then feed my lambs. A second time Jesus said, Peter Johnson, do you love me more than these others do? Peter said, Yes, Master, you know I do. Then look after my sheep. A third time Jesus said, Peter Johnson, do you love me more than these others do? Peter was really cut because he'd been asked this question three times. He replied, Master, you know everything. You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Then he added, When you were young and dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted, when you were old, you hold out your arms and others will dress you and they will take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said, this is to let Peter know what kind of death he would die, and that this death would point people to God. Finally, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. Jesus and John Peter turned around and saw John, the team member who'd always been a real mate to Jesus, walking behind them. It was John who'd sat next to Jesus at their last meal before his death and said, Lord, who is the traitor? Peter saw John and said, What about this bloke, Lord? What will happen to him? Jesus said, That's not your concern. If I want him to live until I come back, what concern is that of yours? Your job is to follow me. That's why some people at the time went around saying that John wouldn't die. But Jesus didn't say that John wouldn't die. He just said, If I want him to live. John is the eyewitness to these things, and he's known to be a truthful bloke. The last word. There are heaps of other things that Jesus did, and all of them and if all of them were written down, the whole planet would be drowning in books about Jesus. The end. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed reading it. I feel about as Aussie as a burnt sausage after reading all that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the reason why I read that to you guys is because um, I just, it's not because it's so biblical or anything like that. It's not because I, I, I believe in butchering the word of God or um, anything like that. It's be, I, I, I'm a, as I said before, I love the King James Bible. But the reason I read that to you, besides it's good to have a laugh sometimes, is that um, 
and I think it's a great story, really, when it's said in the Aussie vernacular too, um, is that it's such a universal message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this proves it, that uh, even in the most far-flung colony on the other side of the world, as far away from where Jesus ever walked in his, in his uh, flesh, he's definitely here in Australia um, in the spirit. He's here right now on this broadcast. Uh, so, not me, but, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, I mean by that. Uh, but, yeah, it's just a universal message that even in the Australian, uh, jargon, it rings true. And, um, if, if God was real, which he definitely is, uh, you would think that the story of the Son of God would be a universal message that could be told in every, any language, any culture. Um, and yes, yes, it is true. And uh, the, story, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ proves that. So praise God and praise Jesus. Um, praise God for his word. Uh, it's Where would we be without it? So thank you, God. And... Uh, Peace out to all of you out there. I hope you enjoyed that. Praise Jesus. Amen.